Poetry Center bringing poetry to Patterson since 1980 at Passaic County Community College. Okay, today I'm very pleased to um, welcome Richard Blanco, who uh, was the uh, prize winner for the Patterson uh, Poetry Book Award this year. And um, uh, Richard was selected by President Obama to be the fifth inaugural poet. His book of poetry, books of poetry include City of a Hundred Fires, which received the Agnes Starrett Poetry Prize from the University of Pittsburgh Press, Directions to the Beach of the Dead, which won the Beyond the Margins Award from the Penn American Center, and Looking for the Gulf, Gulf Motel, which won the Patterson Poetry Prize the Maine Literary Poetry Award, and the Tom Gunn Award from the Publishing Triangle. But Blanco is a recipient of two Florida, Florida Artist Fellowships, a Residency Fellowship from the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, a John Charlie Fellow of the Bread Loaf Writers Conference, and is a Woodrow Wilson Visiting Fellow. A builder of cities as well as poems, he holds a Bachelor of Science in Silver, Civil Engineering and a Master's in Fine Arts in Creative Writing from Florida International U University. He currently lives in Bethel, Maine. And I want to say about Richard Blanco that his poems are passionate and moving and specific and rooted. And once you hear one of his poems, you are going to forget the poem anytime soon. And isn't that the mark of a really wonderful poet? Let's welcome Richard Blanco. Hey. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. It's great to be back here, back home. Um, little anecdote, I think it was just days before um, I, I had come here and done a workshop and a reading for, for this book that won the Patterson Prize. And uh, it was just days after I think I got the call from the White House, so it's my little good luck place here. <laughs> I wonder what will happen when I come go home tonight. <laughs> so, but thank you, uh, the Poetry Center and Maria have always been home uh, since book one, uh, very supportive and championing of my work and the Patterson Prize is um, just a great honor, and, and, but also the cherry on top for a place that just does such wonderful work supporting authors and supporting poetry. Uh, and everyone's love for poetry. So thank you, Maria. Um, yes, <laughs> who, is, who, is, who, is, who is also known as, as my good grandmother. Um, uh, you'll meet my evil grandmother in a minute. Um, she's the good Italian grandmother, the other one's the, the evil Cuban one. Um, anyway, I don't have much new, much new work uh, for obvious reasons. It's been quite a year. <laughs> been quite busy uh, and uh, actually I read last time from this from the same book so uh, what I'll try to do is throw in some old new some old some old stuff that will seem new to you and just one or two new new poems maybe just one uh, from the inauguration um, what I'd like to do is sort of give you a little bit of a narrative of that emotional road to the podium in Washington DC in a way real quickly in 30 minutes um, in some ways, um, getting a call and being asked to write a poem for America seems like something I've been doing all my life in some, in some way. Um, this perhaps even before I was born. Um, as the story goes, I was made in Cuba, assembled uh, in Spain, and imported to the United States. So my mother left seven months pregnant from Cuba. I was born in, in Madrid, and 45 days later, we came to the United States. So by the time I was 45 days old, those questions of home, what is home, what is my place in America, in some ways, were, were already present. Um, if that wasn't sort of a foreshadowing of you know, some higher power saying, guess what you're going to be obsessed about, um, all these questions of identity and place and belonging. Um, to complicate matters further, uh, we moved to Miami. Um, in a galaxy, galaxy very far, far away. And what that meant in Miami, which is still a strange place, uh, strangely wonderful, um, I grew up between two imaginary worlds. One was the 1950s and 60s Cuba of my parents and the stories and the photographs and all the gossip and all the nostalgia that, that was that world, that paradise that we were going back to someday, supposedly. And then the other sort of imaginary world was America because Miami, as anybody knows, as we like to say, we love living there because it's so close to the United States and you don't need a passport. 
Um, by that, I mean that my entire community was Cuban, and so America still felt like this other place that I was still yet to go to. And Miami was kind of like a purgatory, <laughs> a cultural purgatory, waiting somewhere between the real imagined Cuba and the real imagined uh, America. And how I contextualize America a lot was through, uh, I was a rerun junkie um, for, for the most part, um, and all those uh, Brady Bunch and Leave It to Beaver, so I had this idealized version of America. I really believe a place like that existed. So anyway, I'd like to share this first poem with you, uh, which comes from the book. Um, and I think here you'll see little Ricky sort of navigating um, some of what, what I'm talking about. It stems from a, um, one of the most bizarre memories that I have of my childhood, which was watching the Miss America pageant with my crazy Cuban family. Betting on America. My grandmother was the bookie. Set up at the kitchen table that night, her hair in curlers, pencil and pad, jotting down two dollar bets, paying five to one on which Miss would win the crown that year. Abuelo put his money on Miss Wyoming. She's got great teeth, he pronounced, as if complimenting a horse, not her smile filling the camera before she whisked away like a cloud in a creamy chiffon dress. I dug up enough change from the sofa and car seats to bet on Miss Wisconsin, thinking I was as American as she, because I was as blonde as she was, and I knew that's where all the cheese came from. <laughs> that wasn't all. Chocolate was from Miss Pennsylvania. The capital of Miss Montana was Helena. Mount Rushmore was in Miss South Dakota, and I knew how to say Miss Con Connecticut. <laughs> Unlike my Tia Gloria, who just pointed at the TV. Esa, esa, that one, claiming she had her same figure before leaving Cuba. It's true, es verdad, I have pictures, she declared, before cramming another bocadito sandwich into her mouth. <laughs> Papa refused to bet on any of the misses because Americanas all have skinny butts, he complained. There's nothing like a big culo cubano. <laughs> Funny how that never needs translation. <laughs> Everyone agreed, eh, beda, eh, beda. except for me and my little cousin Julito, who apparently was a breast man at age five, <laughs> reaching for Miss Alabama's bosom on the screen, the leggy mulata sashaying in pumps and swimsuit, seducing Tio Pedro into picking her as the sure winner. She's the one. She looks guana, he swore, and she did but she cost him five bucks. <laughs> Cojones, he exploded as confetti rained down. Bert Parts leading Miss Ohio, the new Miss America, by the hand to the runway. Gloves up to her elbows, velvet down to her feet, crying diamonds into her bouquet, the queen of our country, of our land of the free, amid the purple mountains of Her Majesty, floating across the stage and our living room, though no one bet on her, and none of us, not even me, could answer Mama when she asked, Chico, donde, where is Ohio? <laughs> So um, that poem was obviously from a child's point of view, one of childhood poems. Um, but this whole idea of, again, place and belonging is something that continues to obsess me to this day, something that obviously has no, no complete answer and therefore is the subject of art, of poetry. Um, and um, that question is, becomes, uh, was, is especially uh, pertinent when it came to my mother. Uh, my mother uh, left every single relative behind in Cuba. And, um, you know, we've, growing up, we always understood her story as a story of courage and a story of longing and loss. But when I got the call to write the poem, uh, that same question, uh, that same question as seen through her life came back to me. And I hadn't realized this, which was that her story was also very much a story about faith. Um, I had never thought about that. I never thought what faith it took for her to pack, to, 
to leave every single relative, and you know that for Latino families, that means that every neighbor, everybody, to get on that plane and leave for the sake of basically what is the quintessential sort of American dream story. So um, she was, she's one of the first persons I thought of when I, when I was asked to write the poem. Um, and so this is the, the third of the three inaugural poems I had to write. I, I don't know if that's common knowledge, but I had to write three of them. They made the Cuban write three of them. I don't know why. <laughs> three poems in three weeks. <laughs> so um, in this poem, I asked the reader to, and myself to place themselves in uh, my mother's emotional shoes and think about what it would be like to get up from these seats right now and leave forever. Mother country, madre patria. To love a country as if you've lost one. 1968, my mother leaves Cuba for America, a scene I imagine as it's standing in her place, one foot inside a plane destined for a country she knew only as a name, a color on a map, or glossy photos from drugstore magazines. Her other foot anchored to the platform of her patria, her hand clutched around one suitcase, taking only what she needs most, hand-colored photographs of her family, her wedding veil, the doorknob of her house, a jar of dirt from the backyard, goodbye letters she won't open for years, the sorrowful drone of engines, one last deep breath of familiar air she'll take with her, one last glimpse at all she'd ever known, the palm trees wave goodbye as she steps onto the plain. The mountains shrink from her eyes as she lifts off into another life. To love a country as if you've lost one. I hear her once upon a time reading picture books over my shoulder at bedtime. Both of us learning English, sounding out words as strange as the talking animals and fair-haired princesses in their pages. I taste her first attempts at macaroni and cheese, but with chorizo and peppers. <laughs> and her shame over Thanksgiving turkey is always dry, but countered by her perfect pork benil and garlic yuca. I smell. I smell of the rain of those mornings huddled as one under one umbrella, waiting for the bus to her 10 hour days at the cash register. And at night, the zzz of her sewing her own blouses and quinceanera dresses for her grown nieces still in Cuba, guessing at their sizes and the gowns she'd sell the neighbors to save for a rusty white sedan. No hubcaps, no air conditioning, sweating all the way through our first vacation to Florida theme parks. To love a country as if you've lost one as if it were you on a plane departing from America forever, clouds closing like curtains on your country, the last scene in which you're a madman scribbling the names of your favorite flowers, trees, and birds you'd never see again, your address and phone number you'd never use again, the color of your father's eyes, and your mother's hair, terrified you could somehow forget these. To love a country, as if I was my mother last spring, hobbling, insisting I help her climb all the way up to the capital, as if she were here before you today, instead of me, explaining her tears, her cheeks pink as the cherry blossoms coloring the air that day. And she stopped, turned to me, and said, You know, mijo, I've been thinking. It isn't where you're born that matters. It's where you choose to die. That's your country. So 
So since Maria mentioned my engineering, um, which is, that apparently wasn't very sexy, sexy enough for the media. I'm the first engineer in audio <laughs> poet as well. <laughs> That's not that sexy. Um, uh, or, I, well, anyway, I'm not, I'm not going to go on that. <laughs> but anyways, um, this, is a, this is a poem that gives, us, gives, uh, gives a little bit of the emotional underpinning of some of my decision to be an engineer. And I have been a practicing engineer all my life, um, as if we had a choice with poetry, but to have another job. <laughs> um, so um, it's really sort of couched in my relationship with my father. And, it's, and it was during a time that I was doing some, a lot of bridge design. And um, there's just a little geometry you need to know here. Um, this takes place over a bridge. It's, uh, anybody's been in Miami, it's like the highest point in Miami, call it Mount Miami, as you cross the Miami River. And as this one of the best vistas in Miami, and to the, to the right, left, you have all what we call the Civic Center, which is all the hospitals, like the hospital complexes, and then the skyline, and then all the sort of green and terracotta roofs on the bottom. That's where this takes place. Papa's Bridge. Morning, driving west again, going to work, away from the sun rising in the slit of the rearview mirror. As I climb on slabs of concrete and steel bent into a bridge, arcing with all its parabolic Y squared splendor. I rise to meet the shimmering faces of buildings above treetops meshed into a calico of greens, forgetting the river below runs, insists on running and scouring the earth, moving it grain by grain. And if only for a few inclined seconds every morning, I'm 12 years old with my father standing on the 10th floor window of his hospital room, gazing back at the same bridge like a mammoth bone aching with the gravity of its own dense weight. The glass dosed by a tepid light reviving the city as I watched and read his sleeping, wondering if he could even dream in such dreamless white. Was he falling? Was he flying? Was he falling? Was he flying? Who was he? Who was I underneath his eyelids, flitting like the birds across the rooftops and early morning stars wasting away? The rush hour cars pushing through the avenues like the tiny blood cells through his vein, the ivy spiraling down like a string of clear licorice feeding his forearm, bruised pearl and lavender, colors of the morning haze and the pills on his tongue. The stitches healed while the room kept sterile with the usual silence between us. For three days, I served him water or juice in wilting paper cups, flipped through muted soap operas and game shows, filled out the menu cards stamped bland diet for three nights. I wedged flat, strange pillows around his bed, his body shaped like a fallen S, mortared in place by layers of stiff percale. When he was ordered to walk, I took his hand. Together, we stepped to the window, and he spoke. Mijo. You'll know how to build bridges like that someday. Today, I cross this city, this bridge again, still spanning the silent distance between us with the memory of a father and son holding hands and secretly in love. So here's um, Maria's, um, <laughs> here's the shadow side. <laughs> uh, this is uh, the poem by my grandmother, I promise you. So um, um, the, the story with this is that um, my grandmother 
I, um, I had really never come out to in my poetry until this third book, um, and I and I was searching why, and I and I, I kind of realized in this third book is that I hadn't found quite the right story to tell. It wasn't just a coming out story, but this idea of cultural sexuality came to mind. In other words, I can't separate who I am as a Cuban man or a child of Cuban uh, parents, who I am as a gay man, and this idea of how these things collide and intersect and 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 connect. Um, and to my grandmother who was as homophobic as she was xenophobic. So anything that was culturally odd to her was also gay. So <laughs> things like Fruit Loops, um, <laughs> Legos, uh, uh, the Boy Scouts, anything in English, gay. <laughs> so I had very little wiggle room as a child. Um, and so this poem is, is sort of her take, uh, my take, well, it's, it's, it's in her own voice, and it's my take of some of her audacity. <laughs> and the other thing is that I realized also that that, that that search for home also folded into this idea that of more of a figurative home, so that the idea that 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 longing for safe space as a gay man is something that is also that sense of being in that home, being in a place where you feel safe and, and can be yourself. And that I think is all wrapped up in, in, in my mind and in my work. Queer theory according to my grandmother. <laughs> Never drink your soda with a straw. Los hombres don't use straws. Milkshakes? Maybe. Stop buying your mother's Avon catalog and the men's underwear and those Sears flyers. I've seen you. Stay out of her Tupperware parties and perfume bottles. Don't let her kiss you. She kisses you much too much. Avoid hugging men, but if you must, pat them real hard on the back, even if it's your father. Must you keep that cat? Don't pet him so much. Ay, mijo, why don't you like dogs? Never play house, even if you're the husband. And quit hanging out with that Henry kid. He's too pale. And I don't care what you call them, those ye I Joes of his are dolls. Don't draw rainbows or flowers or sunsets. I've seen you. Don't draw at all. No coloring books either. Put away your crayons, your Play-Doh, your Legos. Where are those Hot Wheels, your laser gun and handcuffs? The knives I gave you for Christmas. <laughs> Never fly a kite or roller skate, but light all the firecrackers you want. Kill all the lizards you can. Cut up worms. Feed them to that cat of yours. <laughs> Don't sit Indian style with your legs crossed. You're no Indio. Stop click clacking your sandals. You're no Tropicana chorus girl. And for God's sake, never, ever pee sitting down. <laughs> I've seen you. Never take a bubble bath or wash your hair with, with shampoo. Champu is for women, so is conditioner, so is el mousse, so is hand lotion. Never file your nails or blow dry your hair. Go to the barber shop with your abuelo. You're not unisex, are you? <laughs> Stay out of the kitchen. Los hombres don't cook. They eat. Eat anything you want, except deviled eggs, blow pops, croissants, bagels, maybe, cucumber sandwiches, and those petite fours. <laughs> Don't watch Bewitched or I Dream of Genie. Don't stare at the six million dollar man. I've seen you. Never dance alone in your room. Donna Summer, Barry Manilow, The Captain, Antonio, Neal, Bette Midler, and all musicals, forbidden. Posters of kittens, Star Wars, or the Eiffel Tower, forbidden. Those fancy books on architecture and art, I threw them in the trash. You can't wear cologne or puka shells, and I'd better not catch you in clogs. If I see you in a ponytail, I'm cutting it off. Gay? What? No, you can't pierce your ear left or right side. I don't care. You will not look like a goddamn queer. <laughs> I've seen you, even though you are one. Thank you.
So, um, so I'm going to read, um, I think I'll read the Gulf Motown, though we'll cut it. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, this poem, oh, to give you a long story narrative, a long, short narrative uh, interlude here. Um, I went to Cuba, realized Cuba was amazing, but it still wasn't home 100%. So I figured, well, let's go to, let's go to, let's go to America. So I got a job in uh, Connecticut. Um, and I packed my bags at 30 years old, um, left Miami and thinking sleigh rides in the snow, um, <laughs> Rian, Martha Stewart and arts and crafts every Tuesday. I mean, I still had this romanticized version and then moved to Hartford. Um, <laughs> and that didn't quite work out. Uh, so uh, I moved uh, all over the place uh, and traveled a lot. And it finally took me a, a while to realize one of my favorite p quotes from Pascal that says, the sole cause of a man's unhappiness is that he does not know how to stay quietly in his room. Um, so I thought, let me go back to my room, which was Florida, which was in general South Florida. I'm thinking this is the only place that understood this animal, this living in between spaces. And that didn't quite work out. Um, this poem speaks to that adage of you can't go back home. Um, I took my partner, uh, uh, Mark, to Marco Island, expecting, which is a place where we used to vacation since my, uh, before teen, even before I was a teen, poor man's vacation, you know, $78 for the week <laughs> in July. <laughs> um, thinking, of course, that after 25 years, nothing had changed because nobody gave me the memo or I didn't sign off on anything. My memories were never going to be destroyed. And what I found is I found myself in this incredible rant um, and realized that I had become my parents, that I was speaking about my, my own lifetime, about my own places in the way that my parents spoke about losing their Cuba, and realized that this was more about really immortal, uh, one's mortality than anything else, that trying to hold on to things. So here's the poem, and I'll end on this one, and we'll move on. Looking for the Gulf Motel. There should be nothing here I don't remember. The golf motel with mermaid lampposts and ship's wheel in the lobby should still be rising out of the sand like a cake decoration. My brother and I should still be pretending we don't know our parents, embarrassing us as they roll the luggage cart past the front desk, loaded with our scruffy suitcases, two dozen loaves of Cuban bread, brown bags bulging with enough mangoes to last the entire week, our espresso pot, the pressure cooker, and a pork roast reeking garlic through the marble lobby. <laughs> All because we can't afford to eat out, mijo. Not even on vacation. Only two hours from our home in Miami, but far enough away to be thrilled by the whiter sands on the west coast of Florida, where I should still be for the first time watching the sun set instead of rise over the ocean. There should be nothing here I don't remember. My mother should still be in the kitchenette of the Gulf Motel, her daisy sandals from Kmart squeaking across the linoleum, still gorgeous in her teal swimsuit and amber earrings, stirring a pot of arroz con pollo, adding sprinkles of onion powder and dollops of tomato sauce. My father should still be in a terry cloth jacket, smoking, clinking a glass of amber whiskey in the sunset at the golf motel, watching us dive into the pool, two sons he'll never see grow into men who will be proud of him. There should be nothing here I don't remember. My brother and I should still be playing Parcheesi. My father should still be alive, slow dancing with my mother on the sliding glass balcony of the Gulf Motel. No music, only the waves keeping time. A song, only their minds here, 10,000 nights back to their life in Cuba. My mother's face should still be resting against his bare chest, like the moon resting on the sea and the stars 
The stars should still be turning around them. There should be nothing here I don't remember. My brother should still be 13, sneaking rum in the bathroom and sculpting naked women from sand. I, I should still be eight years old, dazzled by seashells and how many seconds I can hold my breath underwater. But I'm not. I'm 38, driving up Collier Boulevard, looking for the Gulf Motel, for everything that should still be, but isn't. I want to blame the condos, their shadows for ruining the beach in my past. I want to chase the snowbirds away with their tacky McMansions and yachts. I want to turn the golf courses back into mangroves. I want to find the golf motel exactly as it was and pretend, pretend for just a moment that nothing I've lost is lost. Thank you. Is that wonderful or what? I told you. Our next reader is Joseph Millar, and uh, he's one of the finalists in, for the Patterson Poetry Book Award. Uh, Joseph Millar's three collections are Overtime, Fortune, and Blue Rust, all from Carnegie Mellon Press. His work has won fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and a 2008 Pushcart Prize, and has appeared in such magazines as Double Take, Tri-Quarterly, The Southern Review, The American Poetry Review, and Plowshares. Millar is now core faculty at Pacific University's Low Residence MFA and lives in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I'm going to say about Joseph Millar that uh, we read together in California, I don't know, six years ago or seven, a while ago. And um, I just was so impressed with how rooted and truthful and fear, fearless his poems were. And so I'm so thrilled that you're here today, Joseph, and that I have the pleasure of introducing you to this audience, Joseph Millar. Well, it's a great honor to be here. And it was, it was a, a great honor to be in this workshop this morning with uh, some, some of, of you and to be in the neighborhood of uh, the great Dr. Williams. I mean, the doc, this is where he's from. You know, <laughs> we get to be here and read with a doc, right? You know, I just uh, 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 admired him my whole life. And uh, so, um, so uh, I'll, I'll read a poem, uh, this poem from the book, which is the first one, which is a poem of, uh, of imagining uh, myself getting born. And uh, I got the idea for this uh, from reading this, uh, reading this book uh, called Autobiography of a Yogi by uh, Yogananda. And he says in there, that he can remember when he is lying in bed and he's crying and uh, his parents were speaking to him and he could pick out their Bengali dialect from all the sounds of the universe coming down on him and he could understand them, but he couldn't make them understand him. And uh, so that pissed him off and he was crying a lot. And uh, so I thought that would be a good uh, subject for a poem. And, and it ends with uh, the song title of a song by Woody Guthrie, it's the ending. But it's called Nativity. Um, not to brag or anything. <laughs> or be sacrilegious. <clears throat> Long after daybreak, they were still trying to deliver me the birth blood dropping 
on the hospital tiles, glittering under the lights. I saw my father's corporal stripes, his tan army shirt that smelled of tobacco. I heard the cold wind no one remembers pouring down out of Canada. My mother wrapped me up in her robe, fragrant with camphor and sweat, hushing my desolate howls. She loved me and she hated me through those early months when I wanted everything she had and all my father wanted, aside from her warm body, was to finish his hitch and get the hell out of the army forever. Each morning, fine grains of salt glinted like ice on the kitchen table. And like the insatiable mammal I was, I fastened on to her chafed dark nipples. They named me rent money because I didn't pay any. They named me Popsicle, Little Tongue, Gasser. In August, the Japanese surrendered and he mustered out in Wisconsin. We headed east in a 38 Studebaker, its big engine swallowing the miles of America, wheat fields and highway, Chicago and Cleveland, and they named me so long it's been good to know you. <laughs> um, here's uh, this is a poem called Ginsburg. It was the time of the pin oak leaves and the hijacked bus upside down in the ditch. It was the spring of 1970, and Ginsburg ate peaches from a can and stroked each cow on its face before leaving for D.C. on a plane where the ghosts of four students hung in the air like tear gas over the huge angry crowds, where he would sound his guttural alm across the White House lawn after the speeches ended, then tell everybody to pick up their trash. When the sun went down, the trouble started. Chuck Berry was playing a half-empty armory, trying to pay down his tax bill. Someone set fire to a squad car outside, and we roamed the streets, half drunk with the night air, <coughs> and the moon overhead, which we thought we could swallow, its pale rocks and electric dust, the shadowy lakes on its dark side, though it was daylight in Vietnam, land of rice paddies and ancient poetry, land of the lotus pond hidden from sight, its presence so hard to know. You guys, you, guys, you guys don't have to keep clapping because, you know, I mean, you know, shit. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, this one's called Lorca in California. It's like imagining, imagining Lorca, you know, one of my favorite poets of all time, if he, if he, was, if he came to California. It talks a little bit about... Uh, Dali, you know, who he had an affair with uh, for a while, and Luis Bunel. Half the time I'm alone at night when the raccoons come down to the yard, rummage collectors, chewers of pine cones. They sniff the flowers and the possum's carcass, seething with the white mouths of death. I grew tired of the poet dressed in black. Like the night of no moon, the carved balconies and colonnades, hot house Madrid, its old lacquer. I could care less about Dali now. His glass clocks and corpses 
his giant mustache, or Bunel's fake lenses and flickering lights, all that bright equipment. I want to stay here forever, in this ramshackle hut with its roses and dog hair, its peach tree blossoms, pollen and dust, the compost fuming out back by the fence. My new lover works on the tuna boats. He comes home smelling of old rope and anchovies, money in both his front pockets, shiny blue scales on his boots. <laughs> um, here's a poem. Uh, this is a poem, uh, uh, you know, where it's kind of a pro-labor poem, and it calls out, uh, at the end, it calls out, among other people, a Andrew Carnegie and uh, Henry Frick. Andrew Carnegie being the original donor of my publisher, so probably if he was alive, he'd say I was biting the hand that was feeding. <laughs> when it starts out with a reference to, uh, to, the, to the movie The Deer Hunter, and that where it opens and they're, they're getting out of work, and, uh, and this one, the big tall guy, Axel, lies across the open uh, trunk of, the, of that white Cadillac and pretends to have intercourse with the car. Uh, you know, kind of a Western Pennsylvania uh, deal there. It's called Fire. When Axel starts humping the Coupe de Ville's trunk in Michael Chimino's The Deer Hunter, America raises its iron voice over the coal fields of Pennsylvania, backyard engine blocks, chain hoists, bell housings, toothed gears resting in pans of oil, stammering out the poem of combustion, bright tongues and wings, white hot ingots glimpsed in the huge mills by the river, coke ovens, strip mines, brick stacks burning over the spine of the Appalachians, Carnegie, gifter of libraries, Frick, with his Rembrandts, his Titians, both fast asleep in the arms of the strike breakers under the ashes and slag. Fire with no roots, no memory, grooved steel running all night to Detroit. Fire of the profit line, fire of the shareholders, eye beams, pistons, fenders, and chrome. Um, so, well, you know, how about this one? This poem, this poem is called Day of the Dead. Last night the owl swooped low overhead and dropped a torn hen carcass on the neighbor's roof. Red feathers scattered, feet hanging down, which they've left sprawled on the shingles like some occult sign, hoping to see him return. And here come the children up the walk, through the pine mulch and drizzle, into my yellow porch light. Count Dracula with porcelain fangs, a five-year-old Cleopatra wearing a vest with gold trim. All day, I've tried to ignore the ice cream truck, jingling its bell past the cemetery, where the tramp in his watch cap sings to himself like a mad general or movie director. Jean Cocteau, letting the stage dust filter the twilight underworld where death looks like a torch singer who wants to make love to Orpheus or Sam Peckinpah with his bullets and dynamite getting ready to blow up the water tower, the script in one hand and a gin in the other 
keeping an eye out for beauty. They held my friend's funeral yesterday, out west under the night's long windows, under its dying stars. My friend, who didn't trust doctors or cops, who left behind him the green country roads and the tilted black streets of town, who left behind the pale flower whose delicate roots they never could find blooming inside his brain. The children paw through the sugar skulls, their big sister hanging back in the shadows, whispering into her cell phone like a homicide detective. The vampire count, an Egyptian queen, history's most famous suicide. Listen to the night freight coming down, its engines, its wheels, its sacks of ripe grain, its gray rats grown fat by the iron tracks, its love moan traveling back through the rain. Yeah. I got a new poem here. Um, it's about the moon. It's called Claire de Lune. We started back from the coast in the darkness, watching out for black ice. With evergreen branches on either side, the sea wind pushing us up from the beach, and five or six people coughing, everyone trying to rest. On a morning like this, the sky draws close. You can see the faint stars, a strand of blue fog, half covering the fulsome, promiscuous moon. Everyone knows she'll go home with anybody. Even you, in your secondhand shirt, with aspirin in the front pocket, your tongue asleep in your mouth, like a reef fish tasting of smoke and wine its songs left behind on the ribbed sand, abandoned there by the ebb, song of watching the crab boats at night, song of water in the house plants. She'd follow you home to your skeletal orchard, your barn with its vagrant wisps of hay, though she surely won't let you sleep, hours from sunrise over the driveway, shining into your kitchen. They say she went home with Stanley Kubrick in 1968, posed naked under his arc lights. She shines on the bus driver's blonde ponytail. She's making big eyes at him. His hands on the wheel with their black leather cuffs shines on the sheet metal covering the engine and the road's thin shoulders speckled with rock salt hunched against the dawn. Mm -hmm.